termites. What's happening? Welcome to episode eight. For you people who follow story time, it's kind of a sad time because I had the grand termite here for a few days and uh, we didn't, we were going to do a podcast and then, well, we started golfing and drinking and it just, uh, you know, time got away from us, but you can pretend he's right there and there will be a message from the grand termite on YouTube. We did get to that. Um, but more exciting than that, let's just put him aside for a second. What do I have in my hands? What do we always like to talk? Well, first of all, what am I drinking? I'm drinking a, nat a nat Natty Light, a giant one. In ch because why? In celebration of, look at this. These are natural light beer flavored peanuts. This is part of my junk food segment that I like to do, also known as gas station food, also known as shit food. But peanuts are a little more healthier. Well, you think they're healthy. That's what I used to think on a plane. Might as well have had a pretzel. Sodium, 30 milligrams, that's why I like it. Salt lick. Carbohydrates, 14. <sighs> but anyway, and there's a picture of Mr. Uh, Peanut. It's his 21st birthday. He can now drink the Natty Light. Anyway, if you guys want to get some beer-flavored peanuts, Natty Light, and Mr. Peanut, I remember as a child, you had to save up something. I don't know what it was, but I saved up all kinds of whatever coupons or some shit to get my Mr. Peanut doll, which I got. I was probably only like five or six. And then my um, beagle <laughs> ate it. And then <laughs> there were no more. So it was a sad time in 1970-something. And um, this, which I, well, might as well just pop this beer, pour a little of it, it's so exciting. And it's got the AB logo on it. I think they're all one company. I can't do the research, but I, I wouldn't even drink Natural Light when it was part of Anheuser Busch because I'm an Anheuser Busch baby. I was my all of my food and heat and lighting, everything was provided by Anheuser Busch back in the day because that's where all my relatives worked. But now I think they're all the same company. I don't even know. Somebody Google it anyway. Here's what's super exciting. See this collapsible dog bowl? Well, that's because I'm on the wait list for the bush beer for dogs. And no, it's not beer. Please don't email. Oh my God, I can I think I want an alcohol to do a dog. I don't know, but I know it shouldn't have it. And I was hoping when Ron was here, his dog Mustard would be able to try the uh, beer for dogs, but it's not here yet. But they sent me this to tide me over, which is a collapsible dog bowl. Isn't that nice? If you're out on a little walkie walk or something. There you go. Put a little water, probably not food, just water, maybe dry food. Put that in there. Um, I didn't show you guys this last week because I forgot I had it um, when I was talking about the Old Bay seasoning. And I don't know if, if they've restocked because the internet broke. Well, not the whole internet, but their part broke over the Old Bay hot sauce. This is like the restaurant size. It's a limited time, so I would suggest if you go on there, um, get this size. It's 64 ounces, which if you're bad at math, which I am, it says right here, two quarts. Do you ever want, wonder what's in um, hot sauce? Uh, the ingredients, hot sauce. Well, you can't say hot sauce is in hot sauce. I, I know that. Vinegar, love it. Salt, love it. Garlic powder. Distilled vinegar. Spices, including uh, celery seed, mustard. There you go. So that's now here's another junk food update and listen to how light this bag is. Okay, this is supposed to be full. That sound full? No, it's not full because that beast known as Senor Blanco, Mr. White was here and ate them all, which wasn't, they were supposed to be for just for the show. M&Ms with fudge brownie inside. And at first I thought, why would you ruin an M&M? You'd, they didn't. They're great. I would even maybe, I eat one now, might put it above an M&M. Just saying, if you see these, they're in a purple bag. Well, this bag is purple. And then they're about the size of a peanut M&M. And then inside is a brownie. <laughs> it's so bad for you. It's just the worst. But you know, if you're looking for a little treat, don't say I'm not here to help, because I am. And I taste that stuff. Okay, I usually like to start off with a Dolly Parton quote, but I had to tell you what I was drinking first, so it's not really the st t t top of the show, but uh, they have different categories in here. This is on glamor and fashion. I look just like the girl next door if you happen to live next door to an amusement park. 
get it? Good one. Not really. They all can't be winners, but cute enough, right? Cute enough. And look who's holding the bush latte. Dolly. She's upset that Cher got here late. There was a tiny cage fight. Winner. Who's the winner all the time? Small people. Why? Because they're scrappier. Another little thing I'd like to talk about this week is morons doing fantasy football. And by morons, I would be me and my friends. Men and women. Um... There's a lot of us, it turns out, that we always said no to fantasy football because we're too, well, mostly because I'm always flying on Sundays and I never get to see the games and then I don't know what's going on and I just kept saying no, 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 no. And then I see people like my brother-in-law where they're attending real life drafts and it becomes this commitment that I already have an addictive personality. I don't need to be involved in another thing that takes over my life that is literally, you know, not worth like I should be doing something more productive even though I would gamble for hours and hours and hours I just felt like that's contained to a casino this fantasy of football seems to be like an octopus it takes over Thursday and then it takes over Saturday and Sunday well not Saturday sometimes didn't they used to do Saturday games occasionally um yeah Sunday Sunday night Monday and so I just kept saying no and like my friend Drew, he's a finance guy. He's very busy during the week. He doesn't have time for all this. But he kept saying no. Turns out now we all have a little extra free time. This is how bad the league is. And there's only about eight of us. Last week, on a Saturday, somebody declared themselves the winner. <laughs> okay. We'd play one that we only played Thursday's game. And they decided they won the whole thing. So that person is moron. They get the moron prize for that week. Um, second, second place would be my friend, I'm not going to mention any names, Kathy Nelson. She's a Saints fan, and she has chosen the entire Saints team as her fantasy team. I'm like, Kath, I don't think you're getting the fantasy part. That's reality. Your team exists already, and they're called the Saints. You're supposed to make a better team to which any Saints fan, if you know them, will just tell you, there is no better team. You know, who dat? Go Saints. Well, didn't work out. And as somebody on my Twitter here told me, well, what's she going to do when, there's a, when the Saints have a bye week? I'm like, yeah, none of us thought that through. We just keep telling her this is stupid. Wait till her team's fucking invisible. Right now she thinks it's just, you know, kind of sad, but the Saints are going to get it together. And maybe they will. I mean, I, I think they're good, but usually, but I don't know. All right. In other, you ready for this news, termites? Because this is pretty, pretty awesome. Cracker Barrel is adding alcohol to its menu for the first time in history. Which to me means what? The Catholics win again. I do get a little Christian-y vibe in the gift shop of the Cracker Barrel. Y'all been in the gift shop? A little Christian-y. Uh, not, not Catholic-y, Christian-y. And is there a difference? Yes. It's funny because Louis Black, my other BFF, his birthday was August 30th. And what do you get a guy who's got everything he wants and he has enough money to buy what he wants well what he really likes is cracker barrel so i i bought a bunch of little funny things for him but the cracker barrel i got him a 25 dollars gift certificate and i said you can take one friend to lunch only one and you should be happy there's no alcohol there because then you'd have to go alone if you wanted to get your eight dollar glass of wine but there's no alcohol so boom you get under the radar with 25 bucks that's not happening anymore. Although Lou's not really a beer and wine guy, but here's what's going on. It's very exciting if you're a road person because there's really a Cracker Barrel. Oh, Lewis also has, I'm looking at the picture of the chairs. He has one on his deck in New York. I would venture to say he's the only person in New York that his outdoor seating on a deck in New York is Cracker Barrel. And the great thing is I think there aren't 50 bucks. You can just change them out every summer if they go bad, but his didn't go bad. His next birthday, I'm getting him the North Carolina baby blue one which I just saw existed. Um, you can, the next time you go to order a mama's pancake breakfast, I'm not sure what that is on the menu, but I'm sure it exists. You can add a mimosa to your order. Cracker Barrel is getting 
bubbly with the addition of beer and wine and mimosas to its menu for the first time in its company's 51 year history. Okay, just thrown out there, I'm older than Cracker Barrel. I didn't like to see that in print and I just did. What? Seriously, I'm older than Cracker Barrel. It's good to know because then when I go in there, I have a little more authority than I thought I did. I don't know that I'd go for a mimosa at Cracker Barrel because <laughs> the champagne might be. It's just stuff from the back. Okay, I'm not a snob, but is it like Bob's? Because that's going to give me a terrible hangover if I have 11 of them. And if you're bringing out one mimosa, you can sure shit bring out a pitcher. The overall, oh, they're gonna after they're gonna add beer and wine to uh, on the menu to more than a hundred locations. The company is making the change permanent. It's so exciting. Um, the guests are all very excited by it. That's what more of this article says. I did, but bleh. Um, oh, and you will have the option to order mimosa kits to go in some of the locations in both of the offered flavors: classic orange and strawberry. Okay, you didn't need to do that. Just a regular mimosa is fine. We don't need to get strawberry E. Do people drink those? Because you know what? That shit's not sweet enough. Let's make the hangover last three days. It was just a crack barrel, for the record, because you always learn a little something here. Now you'll know when you drive on down the highway. They were established on September 19th, 1969 in Lebanon, Tennessee, which is not too far from Nashville. The company has more than 600 locations in 45 states. And if you're one of the states without them, I feel sorry for you, and you should move to a state that has a Cracker Barrel. <sighs> okay, we have an update. <clears throat> I swear to God, I did not mean for this Jerry Falwell story to keep going. I just said it once initially because I thought it was funny that, well, not funny, ironic, and um, that a christian -y, more than Christian-y, university, and they, you can't drink or smoke or do all that, and their leader guy, you know, turns out to be posting half-nude, drunky pictures, blah, blah, blah. So that, and then I said, well, if there's any more updates, and I don't really even have a Google alert. They just keep coming. This was on August 30th, so we're late, but it just got released. This was after he had to reason, well, he resigned, he faked resigned, then he said he wasn't resigning, then he demanded 10 million bucks, then they gave it to him, and then he sauntered away with a fine glass of Chardonnay. Jerry Falwell was found intoxicating and bleeding at his home following a bombshell report alleging a years-long sexual affair between him, his wife, and another man. He threw the wife under the bus and said he didn't have nothing to do with it, but he flew this guy around the country for like 150 years. Emer an emergency call, so there's a 911 call, uh, reveals that Jerry Fall was found intoxicated and injured on August 30th, a week after news, uh, a week after the report came out about that. He, Falwell's wife called 911 after she had to break into her own home to reach Falwell, who she said was intoxicating and bleeding. Uh, so she called 911, who said she was hurt. She told the dispatcher that Fall was bleeding a lot and had been drinking, but refused to give them much more information. Okay, I've not called 911 that often in my life, but I do watch the Discovery ID channel, and I watch 2020s, a shitload of them. And when 911 asks you stuff, you gotta answer. They ain't putting up with, I don't wanna talk about that. They're just not. They won't keep going. I did listen to the calls on tape. She refused them to give, to give them much more information. The more I tell you the name, the more you're gonna understand why we're not talking to you right now, Becky Falwell told the, well, you called me, lady. That's what I would have said if I was like, well, what up, I probably would have gotten fired. But I mean, you called me and said your husband, um, he was slurring his speech and he'd hit his head on a trash can. Blood was found in the area near empty alcohol bottles. Okay, you know, this guy, at first, I just thought he was a Christian-y, drinky on the side, and he's the president, so he can do what he wants, and he didn't care. But now I'm starting to think, I have a lot of drunk friends, and uh, this is a lot more that, that goes on with them. Like, I don't have to break in their houses because they're on the floor with tiny airplane bottles. I made that part up just because it's funnier. Tiny airplane bottles, drunk on the floor, um, and I can't get in. And they're bleeding. This is a, this is a lot. I think somebody 
may need to call somebody by a little thumb sort of help. Say it, Jerry. <coughs> that's a little over the line. And that's coming from a lady who has a lot of friends who drink a lot. <sighs> so it's going on September 30th, which is what? My birthday. It'll be a month since that happened. And we'll find out. I guarantee you he won't go to, he's not going to rehab. He's probably drinking right now, if not listening to this, because why would he be listening to this? But that's the update that I didn't even go looking for. It just keeps coming. It's the story that won't die. Now, here's some really good, good news. You guys excited about a little good news? New Linda Ronstadt documentary arriving next month. Now, did you guys watch the first one? I didn't talk about this because I watched it a, a while ago, maybe a year ago. It was so good. If you're too young to know who Lynn Serrano is, she was a singer in the 70s. She was great, like pop, think pop. But then she went and did some, um, I want to call them, I always want to say Nelson Mandela songs, but he didn't do songs. Nelson Riddle? I don't know. Some orchestra person. And I didn't buy those albums. But then she went full on Spanish and did these albums in all Spanish and they're traditional Mexican songs because she's half Mexican, but nobody thinks that. Like she says in the thing, because I'm white and I have a, a Germanic last name, they don't think, but she is, she's half Mexican. Riddle. So Nelson Riddle. Yeah, yeah he's the guy. Right. Thank you, Paddles. No Not Nelson Mandela. You don't remember Nelson Mandela's classic songs? No. Me neither. It was a children's show. It was a children's show? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. So here was what we got going. Following last year's The Sound of My Voice, Linda Ronstadt is the subject of another documentary. It's called Linda and the Mockingbirds. And it follows the singer with the Bay Area performing arts group Los Senzantles. That's so wrong. That's so middle America white person pronunciation. That's the best I can do. And Jackson Brown on a 2019 trip to Mexico. It arrives on iTunes October 20th. You can watch for a trailer. You can see the trailer below if you'd like to go online. I did. It looks awesome um, because I really like Linda Ronset. I love her music, but I also really like that she's very um, odd. If you watch the documentary, at one point, like somebody interviews her and they said, well, then the tabloids, it says all you do is go to big parties and you know, you're partying all the time at big parties, whatever that means to who's ever asking that question, Hollywood parties. And she's like, I don't. I'm not even social. I don't go to parties. And then that's the end of that question. She doesn't even give in to it. I like it. Um, uh, the documentary explores Ronstadt's roots in Mexico and her connections to its traditional folk cultures. In 1980, her 1987 album, Canciones de Mi Padre, a collection, I'm doing the best I can, of mariachi songs, is one of the best selling non English records in the United States. Read. Okay, so you can go online and see the trailer. I did. It's on YouTube. Looks great. That'll be coming out. And here's what I really loved. There was this guy, um, Don Lane. I don't even know who that is, but he kind of reminded me of Mari Povich. And I know Mari Povich, and I like Mari Povich, and I don't mean the show, but just his demeanor older guy and he had this apparently a talk show in Australia and she's on the talk show and you can YouTube this and you should YouTube it because I've never seen anybody shoot down an interviewer. Plus, if you're her publicist, your head would have blown into so many pieces during this interview, you wouldn't even know what to have done with yourself. And I'm sure somebody probably wanted to put the brakes on it, but Linda's live, it's too late. So the guy says to her, I don't even know what year this was. It was, uh, it doesn't matter, but you, you can go on YouTube. Put YouTube, um, just Linda Ronstadt talking about performing in South Africa. So when apartheid was at its, its height, she agreed to go to South Africa and do a show. And this guy, he's an American, but he's in Australia. He has a talk show in Australia. He says, you know, well, it's kind of controversial that you're going to go perform in South Africa. And she, she's so, she's crazy smart too. Like you can't, she's not just some, you know, 70s hot singer lady. Like she's crazy smart. She says, oh, why? Because they have a fascist government. Well, you know, if we're going to go off that, that I can't perform where I disagree with the government, 
Well, I mean, then where do we start? I mean, we don't start with racism. How about Boston? She just starts throwing out specific cities. And I'm sure if you're the publicist, you're going, la, 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 la. She goes, what about the entire American South? They're racist, the whole South. She just threw the whole South. And I'm not even saying it's not right, but to say it, uh, she went through, oh, I think England, um, you know, just basically the whole world, which I thought was a good point. Because sometimes people will say to us, you know, don't go to a show there, boycott a show because of A, B, or C. Wasn't Georgia, wasn't I not supposed to be performing in Georgia because of something? I don't remember what. But I always say, yeah, but the people coming to see me didn't do that. Like, I don't, I don't know that saying music or comedy, you know, we should just not show up. We're not entertaining the lawmakers, right? I mean... If Linda Ronstadt had gone there, I don't know. I thought she had a good point, though. If we're going to, she kept saying, well, where do you draw the line? And the guy goes, you're being controversial right now. She goes, what's controversial about not liking racism? <laughs> Boom. What do you say to that, Don Lane in Australia? I think that was his name. I don't even know. I think it's something like that. Just Google Linda Ronstadt interview about performing in South Africa. It'll be in your show notes. Oh, it'll be in my show notes. Paddles just told me that. So you can look there. It's worth it though, because you just don't hear people say things like that anymore. Everybody's so, so particular about what they say and they're so careful about what they say that they're not confident in their own intellectual ability to tango with someone like Don. And I think she did a wonderful job. And she's, uh, she has Parkinson's now, she's, so she can't sing. So that's pretty sad because she's not any older than I don't think any of the ladies standing right here. I think they're, well, she might be a little older than Stevie, maybe. I don't know. Paddles, how old is Linda Ronstadt? Probably 74? I don't even. Yeah, 74. Did I guess it right? Yeah, July 15th. And Stevie's not 74. No. Uh -uh. Carly Simon is 75. Wow, Carly Simon's 75. Emmy Lou Harris, 73. Emmy Lou Harris, 73. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. Um, this is a story <laughs> that I think will be going from Linda Ronstadt. Um, by the way, the other thing I like when you watch the original Linda Ronstadt documentary is she went to all the LA people, the music people, and said she wanted to do an album in, in Spanish, and she wanted it to be traditional Mexican songs. And I'm sure half of them in the offices just fell over going, why is this white chick? But she's half Mexican. And they all said, boo, no, boo, just like the Simpsons, boo. And then she did it, and it sold more albums than, you know, anything ever made. Once again, making them look like um, one tunnel morons. We can quote that. I just made that up. One tunnel. This was an article. This is why I'm here. I'm here to help. And I think you guys should know this. And I don't know what we're supposed to do about it, but it's, it's happening. America is facing a time bomb explosion of millions of super pigs that can reproduce at just three months old, grow up to 400 pounds, and destroy, destroy thousands of square miles of farms and livestock. There are, okay, that's the, that's the headline. And I have Googled the shit out of this. It is not a joke. Like, I'm from Missouri, and I know there's a lot of feral pigs in Arkansas. In southern Missouri, probably. And then I heard about, one time in Arizona, I was going, I had to go do this charity gig, and it was at a resort, and you get your own little casita, and I got there very late, and the guy, I had to walk to it, and uh, he was like, uh, okay, you know, be careful of the javelinas. And I thought he meant the flip-flop. And I said, now why would I be afraid of my own flip-flops? And what he meant was the tiny pigs of the desert, and you can Google, it, Google those, and they travel in gangs, and they attack your ankles. That's what I was told when I asked later at the front desk, what the hell's going, going on out there? I was already aware of you know, snakes and all the things the desert brings, but I didn't know there were super attack gang pigs. But anyway, these are way bigger. Um, 400 pounds, picture that, 
okay? That's two Ron Whites. Can you picture that? That's two Lewis Blacks in one thing coming at you. There are thought to be about 9 million feral pigs across the United States and Canada. Canada, you're involved too. And I checked the stats on this podcast. I know some of you out there are listening, so don't think you're free of this problem. Just when you get all cocky up there, thinking we're fine. Sometimes you're not. <sighs> the numbers are rapidly rising due to the fact that they're able to reproduce at three months old. And there's a scientist, Jack Mayer, and he's trying to tell the world, eh, 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 and nobody cares. It's a crazy situation with everything's happened in what I call the pig bomb, Jack Mayer said, which has exploded in North America. He warned about the rate of reproduction. There's not another animal that can put little feet on the ground quicker than a wild pig. Global warming is partly to blame for more piglets, of which there can be at least 10 in a liver, litter. Uh, at least 10 in one litter are surviving. Once a pig escapes its enclosed, its incl enclosed, because it's a foreign say. It becomes wild and begins to grow tusk. Then they mate with other wild pigs or boars and their offspring become feral. Some states and Canadian provinces have launched educational campaigns for people to spot the animals, report them, and ultimately kill to curb their numbers. This guy, he's been researching these pigs for 40 years and he keeps warning people um, that it's going to happen. The wild population of 6 million right now, 2 million in Texas alone. Texas, you're the, part of the problem here. Florida, Georgia, and California have giant populations too, which I did not know. Um, this is already a repeat. Uh, wow. California and Texas have encouraged recreational hunting as a way to reduce the pig populations. But even if three quarters of the population is killed off, they would be able to rep repopulate within three years. <laughs> Nine million feral swines in 39 states. They're expanding at a rate of 35,000 square miles a year. I've heard it referred to as a feral swine bomb, said Dale Nolte, manager of the National Feral Swine Damage Management Program at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. They multiply so rapidly to go from 1,000 to 2,000 is not a big deal, but if you've got a million, it doesn't take long to get to 4 million, then 8 million. The pigs aren't the cuddly cartoon kind, but a mixture of breeds coupled with wild boar. It's what we cr call it, creates what we call a super pig, said Ryan Brook, a biologist at the University of Saskatchewan in Canada. The super pigs, and then we would know they can grow. Blah, blah, blah. Um, they also carry bacterial diseases. That's fun. Maybe they can carry COVID and parasites too. So far, just one place in the United States and another in Canada are attempting to track and call the expanding pig populations. Montanans have been educated on the issue with a catchy campaign called Squeal on Pigs. Ha <laughs> ha! Get it? I like it. It's funny. Who came up with that? That encourages residents to call a 24-hour hotline should they see any sightings so that wildlife staff can trap and kill the animals. Pigs ended up going wild the moment they had managed to escape from their farm enclosures. After breeding in the wild, that's when they grow tusk and all that. They roam over vast distances of 19 square miles and sometimes turn nocturnal. What? <laughs> Making them even harder to track. <sighs> Ontario, Canada for the Americans. Like. Meanwhile, has been tracking pigs since 2018 in Lake Montana, educating the public. But it doesn't say if they have a snappy slogan, squeal on pigs. There's a website, a little more logical, that's been created. Um, so far, there's about 400 reports of pigs outside their fences. That's just in Ontario. Now, uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. that's what you're going to have to do, people. They're in the Yukon territory. Everything's in the Yukon, though. You can't count that. There's hardly any people up there. So that's fine. Put the pigs up there. But if they multiply, like they say, if you drop a million off, there's going to be a million. Or it'll be three million in Vancouver looking for sushi in an hour. That's how that's going to happen. <sighs> okay. If COVID wasn't enough, there's an election coming up. That could be a feral time bomb. God knows what's going to happen with that. Now we've got to worry about tiny pigs. They look cute till they grow tusk and there's one up your ass. Then it's not cute. 
not when it attacks you, and they can run. They can they can run fast. I've seen that. Put go on YouTube and Google wild boars running. They're not slow. <laughs> they look slow because they're fat, but they're not. It's like an alligator. Now, moving on. Here's a little subject. Here's a little. This is not. This is not at all any kind of apology. Um, zero. But I do talk shit about Facebook a lot um, because I just think, I don't know. I'm just not the biggest fan. I'm on it because of work. And I know some of you guys like it, so I stay. But if I wasn't a comedian and I didn't have stuff to say for real, shows and stuff, I would probably just be on Twitter and Instagram. And TikTok wants us to start learning my dances, but I don't have my dance on yet. I'm getting there. The only person that dances more poorly than me in the, that I've ever seen on tape is Stevie. Where's Stevie? Right there. That, it's not even dancing. It, the, that, yeah, but I, I get it. It's just a lot of this and twirling. Yeah. It's super, super bad. Um, but so is mine. Um, so I'm not on TikTok yet because I don't, other than dancing, i got to figure out something else to do on TikTok. Or I'll just do bad dancing. I'm not scared to do that. I danced so poorly at my brother's wedding, my younger brother, um, people were like, oh, that Elaine thing you were doing was funny. They meant Elaine from Seinfeld, the bad dancing episode. And I'm like, yeah, I wasn't doing that, but thanks. Um, so as much shit as I talk about Facebook, I had watched, and I hadn't talked about it on here because I watched it a while back, The Keepers on Netflix. And initially I didn't want to watch it because I thought it was more about... Um, the priest molesting kids, which well, I've read everything you could ever read, and it just eventually, it, you just get exhausted by the subject matter. But it wasn't about that. It was about a nun got killed in this town, and then they thought that uh, nobody really ever investigated who killed Sister Kathy. So that's what The Keepers is about. In case you looked at it and went, oh, I don't want to watch that, because we've all been overloaded for sure and inundated with the Catholic Church and its uh, bullshit dealings and handlings of all that. Um, this is different because somebody killed this nun. And then here's why I will say Facebook is a good thing. This also applies to when I talk, when we talked about the Vegas thing to, uh, don't fuck with cats that they've solved that because of Facebook, they got a group together of super nerds and super, uh, which I would fit into that group of, of obsessed with serial killer. But well, obsessed with bad video, you know, how do we catch this guy? I'm not really a computer nerd per se, but um, the keepers, these older ladies who were kids in the high school when Sister Kathy got killed and they liked her. And these ladies are older than me, like probably 15 years older than me. And they had a lot of bad nuns and bad priests at the time. Like I never got a bad nun. Somebody cleaned that shit up before I got to Catholic school. I liked my nuns. They were very nice and... Um, yeah, I got nothing. I don't can't think of anything. I even got busted one time. I had a transistor radio and I had a wire up my skirt that went through my blouse and then I hid it under my hair so I could listen to cardinal games during math class. And I totally got busted and I didn't even get in trouble. Sister Barb was like, what are you listening to? I'm like, it's a cardinal game. <laughs> How do you not know that? That was my first thought. How do you not know the cardinals have a day game? Hello. And she just said, put it away. Like, nobody hit us. None of that. But back in the day, you know, for people even 10 years older than me, 15 years old, like my parents, you know, the beating your knuckles and all, that all went on with them. Thank God, because I was left-handed. By the time I got to the party, nobody beat me out of it, but they wouldn't give me a left-handed desk. That's why when right-handed people look at some of us left-handed people go, why do you guys write upside down? Where our arms are all like this. Mine doesn't do that. Mine's like this. But you kind of had to. On a desk. Anyway, I will give Facebook credit because these women that decided, hey, nobody ever figured out who killed that nun that we liked. We're going to try to get to the bottom of it. Um, and I won't tell you what happened. You should go watch it if you're bored, especially during all this when we're limited with outdoor uh, other entertainment. Um, they used Facebook because they were older, so that's where they went. And they got a shitload done. Uh, a shitload. Um, so... I'm going to do some props out to that. And then I told you guys to watch The Vow because I've started it. Now, here's the problem. 
I haven't finished it because it's not finished. It's not that I'm being lazy and neglecting my podcast promises. Um, it's another cult thing. And once again, it's not, I am not searching thing, these things out. It's like we talk about it and then there's just more of it and it just keeps coming. This is a modern cult though, this one. And <laughs> I can't even tell, well, I did Google what happened to the guy because I, I remember seeing something in the news a couple years ago about women that were getting branded with some dude's name. Now, you know, no. I must, well, I'm not start. I'm, I'm not joining any cult where there's something painful that's gonna happen. You're not tricking this lady in with stuff like that. You at least, like the Oregon one we talked about, Wild Wild Country, you know, at least it sounded fun, like they'll be dancing, and there was, <laughs> there was alcohol allowed. They had a disco. Um, you're out west, and there was a lot of space, so you could probably have an animal, like a puppy or something, maybe a horse. But this upstate New York one, first of all, the man they're following is named Keith. Now, I used to do a joke 100 years ago about the founder of the Mormon church, was his name was Joe. And I just thought, you know, every other religion that really got a lot of traction, the guy, leader's name was a little stranger. Buddha, Jesus, Confucius, even Bhagwan. Like Bhagwan, you'd be like, what's that? What's he got going on? I've never heard that name, Bhagwan. But Keith, nothing wrong with the name Keith. One of my very good comedian friends, Keith Alberstadt. You ever heard of him? You should go listen to one of his CDs. He's a funny guy from Nashville, Tennessee originally, now living in New York, New Jersey. Um, I like the name Keith, but I'm not giving up my life for a guy named Keith. You at least have to be full of a little more trickery and change your name to something cool, something weird, something exotic, and he's in Albany. Now, he keeps trying to pitch to people that Albany is the new Rome. Okay, this is another part of episode one where I just go, I, no, I work in Albany. I'm not gonna shit talk Albany. I work, I've worked at the Egg for everybody in Albany. There's a casino somewhere up there. I've worked there too. It's fine. It's like, you know, fun enough. I found an Irish bar. I, which I always will. I found some wings. They didn't have this. Let's hold this like a baby. Notice I didn't get this out when Ron White was here because he would have drank half of this and then we'd be at a hospital. I hid it from him. I let him have the M&M's. Distraction, distraction. What are you holding? This, I'm holding the Old Bay, um, my tub of Old Bay hot sauce. It was on limited edition and now the internet, their website went down because I ordered all of it. So yeah, I mean, Albany's fine. There's nothing wrong with it, but you sure as shit can't tell me it's Rome. And I, I took my mom to Rome. That's another story if you wanna go on Comedy Central something. I, this is not happening. I think that's the name of the show. I told a story about taking my mom to uh, Paris and Rome. That was her one thing. And my dad said he wasn't going because <laughs> neither one of them had apologized for their behavior in World War II. I go, really? That's what you're basing your vacations on? Who's apologized for wars? <sighs> How many years ago? The 40s, so 60 years, 2000, 80 years ago. He's, my dad's still upset about it. Um, so anyway, I took her. So I've been to Rome, and let me tell you what, Albany, love you to death, love working at the Egg, that's the name of their performing arts theater. Um, and there's a hotel downtown I liked, I can't remember the name of it, but, uh, is it Rome? No. And I think the people living there would agree with me. Not quite Rome. Anyway, that's where this cult is. And really, when you just start watching it, I think I'm on episode four, five, four or five, that's all there are. It's basically a version of Scientology. You pay some shit, I thought a lot, like 2,500 bucks to go to a shitty Holiday Inn and watch some lady in a bad suit from Ann Taylor show you a video of how you're gonna be a better version of yourself and how you're gonna, you know, expand everything. And then I just think these people, I mean, we all wanna get better, we all wanna learn, but there's a point where you go, wait, 
Is it the Holiday Inn? Wait, it's $2,500? Not even a free initial one? Like at least Scientology tries to trick you in with their little, you ever seen them outside of the things where they're like, do you want to do a test to learn about yourself? No! And then I run away and go, no! Get away from me! I'll call the cops! I don't do that, I just walk away. But um, I don't even like talking about them on the air because I'm afraid they'll come and get me. Um, but then I'd have to call Leah Remini, and I don't know her, but I do know um, Ray Romano, and in my mind, he knows her. So I would just call Ray and say, could you get Leah to help me? The Scientology people are my podcast. <laughs> anyway, I got to say with the vow thing, I don't get how you're tricked in the 2000s to go to a, a, a shitty ballroom in Albany and pay $2,500 to watch this horse shit. And then you get to the next level and you get a sash. There's little graduation things. And a lot of these people are hot and rich. So Keith, the leader, who you don't get to meet initially, of course, you have to meet the lady in the Ann Taylor suit. Um, he just looks like a dude, wears a lot of eyes odd. I don't trust that either. If you're gonna be my freaky leader, you need to be freaky. Bogwan, he looked like Walter Mercado. Mucho, mucho amor. Bogwan put some effort into his goddamn outfits, and Keith rocks up in shitty Levi's and a Izod. <sighs> you gotta watch it. I just don't. I don't understand. Um, in this day and age, how? I get it if it's free, um, but I don't get, even in the meeting where they're like, okay, so they call it ESP, which normally we all know what ESP means, extrasensorial perception, I think is the exact old timey. But then they, they make up different words for that acronym. So now you're just changing old stuff to make it new. And they're also monitored of how much you can eat. And as soon as you tell me that, if I join, and here's the weird thing. They don't live together in Albany. They live all by themselves in different places in Albany. So he didn't cult them up like we're all going to Oregon on a ranch or down to Jonestown. It's like Scientology. They live amongst you so you don't know who's who. And if you're going to get trick trickaroonied, say I have a couple beers, and then this lady or man in a bar says, hey, you got 25 hundo? And I say, maybe. And then next thing you know, I'm in a ballroom with Linda. I made that up. I can't remember. I think her name might have been Linda. I don't know. It was just a lady in it. Ann Taylor. I might even go as far as to say the outlet. <laughs> the suit was shitty. Um, so I was watching that. And then just when I think, and if this stuff bores you guys, you can tell me in the comments. I read all your comments. If you say, Kathleen, get a little too hung up on this shit. I go, yeah, maybe they're right. I'm not against criticism because I want to talk about um, this other movie that I watched because Ron made me and I wish I do wish we'd have gotten our act together more to talk about it while he was here but first I'm going to um, talk about this because this just happened just when I say okay I'm not searching for this stuff giant health this is a giant um, article September 23rd 2020 Helicopters, armed police swoop in to arrest Russian Jesus cult leader. Oh my God. People, what are we doing? What are we doing out there? I don't think anyone in Russia is listening. And I don't blame anybody in Russia for doing anything because it's just too fucking cold. And they're just throughout fucking. Because I can't stand the cold. All you'd have to do is promise me a lot of blankets and I would join your damn cult in Russia because I'm just, I, I don't know, it's just too cold all the time. This guy though is in a Siberian forest. He th thinks he's Jesus. I'm gonna tell you about him because if you wanna go Google it because I didn't have time because Senor Blanco was here taking up <laughs> a lot of my time. Uh, I didn't get to go look but there are some videos online and I think it's worth checking this shit out. So this is from, this article I'm gonna to read to you guys, parts of, I always edit. I'm not just gonna sit here and bore you like a lady who didn't do any work. This lady, as I take a drink of my beer, is doing work for you guys. 
because I hate to be bored with details that have no matter. Deep in the heart of Siberia's birch forest lies one of the largest and most remote religious communes on the planet. More than 5,000 people have left their families and their homes to, to join the Church of the Last Testament, which has more than 10,000 followers worldwide. So it's not just the 5,000 he has gathered in a forest, yet there are 5,000 other people somewhere on earth that are in on this. The church centers around one man. He is known simply as Vizarion. Now see, Keith? Do you see what he did? He went with Vizarion. I'm not even sure I'm pronouncing that correctly. V-I-S-S-A-R-I-O-N, meaning he who gives new life, or simply as the teacher. Now Oprah says she's the teacher too. So I'd like to have a, a teacher off with Vizarion and Opa. He claims that he is Jesus Christ. Well, this guy, this guy's, or no, it's old lady, Clarissa Ward, whoever wrote this. She'd heard about the self acclaim She said, I'd heard about him. I tried to find him myself. Getting to visit Ryan's commune is not easy. <coughs> Here's how you're going to get there. Ready for this shit? From Moscow, the Russian capital, it's more than 2,000 miles and four time zones away. What? You begin by flying to Abakan. Abakan. And I don't think Southwest goes there. Because I've checked their schedules many, 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 many times. Never seen Abakan. St. Louis to Abakan? Nit. It's a bleak city near the Mongolian border, dotted with crumbling czarist buildings and Soviet-style blocks. Driving through, I decided to ask residents whether they'd heard of Vizarine and what they thought of him. Most people knew who he was, but they didn't seem to like him very much. It's a sect. He presents himself as a demigod, and it all lies in my opinion, Sergei told me. Lena was equally skeptical. I heard they don't eat properly there. They grow vegetables, and that's all they eat. Well, I'm with Lena. Not going to that. I'm cold and now I don't even have a hamburger? No. Once you drive out of the city, the drab, con the, the drab concrete of Abakan gives way to rich rolling plains, sparkling rivers, and tiny hamlets. Right, but we're in Siberia, basically. Let's not forget that. I'm sure it's really nice on one day in July. After a few hours on the road, we finally reach Petra Pavlakova, where more than 80% of the residents are members of this church. Life here is very basic. They're strict vegans, and they don't smoke or drink. <laughs> Two more reasons. <sighs> I'm not going. The houses and churches are built from wood, and most of the energy comes from windmills and solar panels. Where'd they get the money for that? At the school, followers school, little boys are taught how to build model ships, and young girls are on crocheting and singing. Okay. No. Not doing crocheting. Singing, I suck. I mean, I'll do it, but you're going to regret asking me. With all the beautiful nature, it seems an idyllic setting for a child to grow up. Except it's fucking freezing! Pfft. Giant bears? This isn't idyllic. Port, but the portraits of Vizarion that adorned everywhere, every wall were difficult to ignore. They've abolished Christmas! Okay. Well, how are we supposed to have a Hallmark Channel? If you killed Christmas, how am I supposed to watch cheesy movies? with um, Kelly Pickler in them, on the, and I like Kelly, on the Hallmark Channel. That's what me and my mom do a lot of December, and we like it, and we even got my dad on board. He likes it now, too. Um, they don't have Christmas. They have a new celebration for Viz Ryan's birthday. The biggest holiday of the year is August 18th, the anniversary of the teacher's first sermon, and a new calendar was just introduced from the dates of the year of his birth, making this year 48. So they're not in 2020, they're in 48. He was born Sergei Torup in 1961. He worked as a traffic cop up until his revelation. He started the Church of the Last Testament in 1991 in the same year as the collapse of the Soviet Union. Mm, see how he worked it in there? It was a desperate and chaotic time for people. Yep, after decades of religious oppression, suddenly thousands of new religious sects religions and sex burst on the scene, all claiming to have the answers that people were so hungrily craving. The next day, they continued to drive. She ain't even there yet. She's saying my body was shivering nonstop. Exactly. I have no circulation. I didn't have any as a child, and then I smoked all the Marlboro lights that were made in the United States and Mexico. And now I have worse circulation. 
So, I, no. They stopped at a river for a break. They met Siegfried Werner, who left his home in Germany to move here. Oh, many of Visit Ryan's followers are educated people from different European countries. Some of them used to work as doctors, teachers, and engineers. One was even a foreman, Belarusian deputy railway minister. Well, he should have known where he was going. He's probably been on that train. I went... Uh, um, this guy said, I went from Italy, he embraced me very warmly, he took my hands, and then my heart spoke, and it was at that time I never doubted that he was the Christ. Oh, my God. After three hours in the car, the road ended, and the journey on foot began. Oh, my God. At some point, I fall over, and people have to carry me. And I'm going to say it's right here. The four-mile trek to the Siberian forest, Siberian forest, or taiga, as it was known, was brutal. Mosquitoes swarmed menacing overhead and ticks were everywhere. Unsurprisingly, almost two thirds of his Ryan's have, have on them, I think, something, probably Lyme disease. During the 19th, there were reports that some of his dollars died after refusing medical attention. They have, oh, because they have illnesses and all this shit. After finally walking, we reached the abode of the dawn, a small settlement where 250 of Vizarine's most devout followers live. It's four miles to the nearest road and just a couple miles below where the teacher himself lives. At this point, we were assigned minders who monitored our movements until we left. Oh my God. The villagers in the adobe of the dawn follow an entirely vegan diet. When they move here, here's the kicker. And see, I don't think Keith did this. If he did, they don't, haven't talked about it yet in the vow. When they move here, they give the church their pensions and whatever possessions they may have. In return, they get sugar and flour. What? No money is used within the community, but they're given an allowance of 300 rubles, about $12 a month. Oh, my God. You know, I would just rather literally jump off a moving speedboat and hope I fell into a prop than to go into all this. The followers are even more zealous when talking about their teacher. I sat down with a group of women and asked about their first time meeting and visit Ryan. When I first saw, the first time I saw him, my soul recognized him. I could not cope with my emotions, and my soul cried, it's him, it's him, he's on earth, Galena told me. It was as if a flood came down in the sky. My body was shivering. <sighs> Every day the women pour over his vo ten volumes of teaching and five times a day a bell rings upon where the followers turn to pray towards the mountaintop where visit Ryan lives. Oh, my God. <sighs> the children are home school. Government is local government is tactically supportive of Vizarion's group, although the Orthodox Church has denounced them as a sect in Siberia, where alcohol, terrible alcoholism, and a declining population. Vizarion community is one of the very that is healthy, hardworking, and growing fast. Well, yeah, you don't want to be getting too deep into the vodka back there. Um, so then she finally gets to meet the guy. Okay, they have to go up this steep mountain walk. Uh, at the top of the mountain, the followers gather at an altar and sing songs and pray, standing amongst them and intensity of their fervor, with the intensity of their fervor was palatable. As the liturgy grew to a close, I felt excited. We were getting closer to meeting Viz Ryan. It was finally time. My first impression is that he did not actually, that he did actually look how one might imagine Jesus. Well, that's not hard if you're a white dude with brown hair. You know, Keith tries it a little bit, but he's a little too pudgy. He's too pudgy and too short to be a good Jesus. But come on, if we were in L.A. and said we got a Jesus open call, probably 4,000 guys that look just like Jesus would show up. That is not a big trick. He had long hair, flowing white robes, and a kind of smile. He looked the part. But as the interview began, my feelings changed. I asked him to tell me some of the principles of religion. After a good 20-second pause... I hate the pause, because now I know you're full of shit. It's acting. Keith does it a lot. They ask Keith something, and he just stares at you uncomfortably. And you just want to smack him in the face. Maybe that's my anger issue. Maybe. But you know what? No. I get what you're doing. It's a trick. So his answer was, the same as other religions have. People should learn how to love each other. Well, fuck. I could have made that up. I asked him what he enjoyed to do every day, and, he, and what he thought the most important philosophy to live by was. Each question provoked the same long pause. Yeah, blah, blah. I'm so tired of that act. Followed by a monosyllabic reply. Finally, I asked him the question I travel all this way. I say, are you Jesus Christ? Then weird pause. 
it's not necessary to answer this, he told me. Oh, 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 oh. How much trouble do you get in if you hit Viz Orion? That's what I'd want to know. Do you keep, if I hit him, do you keep me? I've never hit a person. But if I went this goddamn far and that's his answer, I asked whether he believed in Judgment Day. There's a time, a certain period of time, during which the destiny of your whole human society will be decided. This period is going on already. <sighs> Maybe it's COVID. And let me tell you what. Florida's decided they don't care. Hold my beer, Florida. 100% open. Okay, okay. We'll see. He did not elaborate on what happened at the end of the period of judgment, nor when that would be. Well, of course, because if you start answering stuff like that and then it doesn't happen, now your whole thing falls apart. At least he's smart enough to know that. The next few questions I asked provoke the same uh, truculent, a word you don't see very often in print, truculent answer. That doesn't interest me. Oh, fuck you. I ask you a question, you go, that doesn't interest me. What a little bitch. Oh, how did this lady not? I would just throw my backpack at him. I'm sure she has a backpack. How else are you? Maybe she, did they give him a, 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 one of the uh, uh, sled dog things like they have in Alaska to get here? I'd make one of my huskies eat him. Attack! <sighs> so I finished by asking if he had anything that did interest him. Exactly. I'm sorry I'm bothering you, Viz Ryan. Free press. Anything you'd like to say? His reply, I'm not interested to tell them anything. Their time has not yet come. Two Americans. <laughs> or viewers of this and Americans. See that the interview is over before it began. I hadn't expected Jesus to be a man of so few, so, few so words. Leaving, I noticed a quad bike parked in front of his house. It seemed ironic that while he was zipping around, his followers trekked up the mountains. Exactly, notice he's got a bike. Traveling back to civilization, I marveled at the zeal of Vizarion's followers. What did they see that I did not? Or what did they, what did I see that they did not? I felt inexplicably disappointed, yet the number of his followers continued to grow. Um, who is Vizarion? The teacher? Well, no, he's not a teacher because he won't teach. Anything you ask him, I'm not interested. <sighs> that sounds like an 80-year-old sitting on the back porch of a bar. And then you walk out there and you go, hey, Ed. Did you see that the Georgia beat Tennessee? I'm not interested. That's what that sounds like to me. You're not a teacher if you won't talk. Sorry, it's part of the deal, Visa Ryan. Even G Jesus talked. Or maybe he was just Sergei Torup, the self-proclaimed Messiah of, yeah. Okay. For the record, he was 29 years old because then I did the Googling of well, who is this dude. If you, if you Wikipedia him, you can see his picture. <sniffs> I, can, I can find right now 5,000 headshots in LA that look like this and they're not trying to look like Jesus. They just do. And then I go, yeah, I can't hire him. He looks like Jesus. Um, you know, he, so he was 29. That's when all this went on. He, I don't know. He's in his 40s now. Um, he rejected his first wife, and then he married a 19-year-old girl who's lived with him since she was a girl of seven. He has six children from the two marriages. Now, here's the great part. This is the arrest. This is how I even found out about this. I'm not looking for cults. I don't Google cults. This just came up. It was crazy. <laughs> a former traffic police officer who declared himself as Jesus reincarnated has been arrested by Russian authorities in a special op... Special operation deep in Siberia. Helicopters and armed forces were used to infiltrate the communities run by Sergei. Oh, now he's 59. Well, he's been doing this a long time. Who is more commonly known by his cult name Vizarion. He and his two aides, Vladimir Vedernikov. Um, and, uh, oh, and Vadim Redkin, a former drummer in the Soviet era boy band were arrested in the operation by agents from Russia's FSB security services, as well as police and other agencies. They were led to waiting helicopters by mass police. He's been running the cult. We know all this. Um, he says, I'm not God. It's a mistake to see Jesus. And it is a make to see, mistake to see Jesus as God. Not according to the nuns that taught me. Same person, Jesus, Holy Spirit. That's why we do the cross thing, right? 
but I'm living the word of God the Father. Everything God wants to say, he says through me. Well, you know what? Bullshit, Vizorion. So God doesn't want to say nothing? Is that what we're supposed to interpret? Because you don't talk. So God doesn't talk? Well, it's not what I was hoping for. I don't want to get to heaven and finally see God and he or she just stands there awkwardly staring at me like I'm in charge. What am I supposed to say? <sighs> I don't know why, people. He claimed that Jesus was watching humanity from close orbit to earth and that the Virgin Mary was running Russia, only later to be claiming to be Jesus. His community believes drawn on Orthodox Christianity, environmentalism, among other ideologies, either veganism, monetary exchange ban, we know all that. Um, Oh, they said they'd clashed with local business interests. Well, the Russian media outlets. Um, it doesn't really say why they went and um, they're going to. Here's what they're going to charge him with: running an illegal religious organization, alleging that cult members were extorted for money and sub, um, subjected to emotional abuse. Now, see, in Russia, I wouldn't even think you'd need a reason. I think Vladimir. We all know who I'm talking about, right? I think Vladdy would say, go get that freak out of Siberia. He's pissing me off. We don't need two leaders in this country. God damn it. And I, Vladdy, am the leader. So apparently there's a YouTube movie about Vizarion, if you're interested. I thought it was pretty interesting, which is why I'm talking about it. Um, now the other movie I'm going to tell you about a little bit about, but I didn't tell you to go watch it, so I'm not going to say everything about it. There's a, this is what Ron says to me, because one of the nights we were well behaved. He goes, well, is there anything you want to watch on Netflix, sweetheart? And I said, I don't know. I'm in the middle of, um, the vow, but you're not into it, so I don't want to do that. And he goes, have you seen my, my octopus, my teacher? I think that's what it was called. My octopus teacher? I said, what's that? Well, it's on Netflix. He goes, it's about a guy. And I know this sounds weird, but he falls in love with an octopus. Well, maybe not in love, but he's fascinated, and it's just the sweetest story I've ever seen. Now, this is coming from a 230-pound Texan who you would not think. Ron is very emotional, and he's very sweet at times. But I wouldn't think this story, so I said, okay. And we turned it on. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to say shit in a sarcastic mode because I know how much he liked it. It'd be like him making fun of my Hallmark movie. I'm trying to enjoy this. And I will say it's some of the craziest footage I've ever seen of an octopus, or of anything underwater. And I didn't, I learned a lot about uh, octopi. I just made that up. What's the plural octopuses? I don't even know. They never mentioned it because we only focused on this one that the guy was obsessed with. Um, but this is where Ron and I, and I think our acts would reflect that. This is where we disagree. I need a lot of information to know what I'm looking at. He doesn't, doesn't care. I'm like, well, what, how'd this guy afford all this? Well, oh, Maddie, that's just not what we're supposed to be focused on. Well, it's weird, Ron. How does a guy take a year off work in his 40s? He looks to be in his late 40s, early 50s, maybe. And every day, you're just going to go in the ocean, which is freezing, and there's sharks. It's in South Africa. And you're going to hunt for this same octopus. And in your mind, you know, this is kind of your thing. I, I don't understand how you afford that. And how is his wife okay with this? I know he has a kid. That's brought into it a little bit. Um, we could talk about it more. But I think you guys should go watch it and then uh, put in the comments what you guys think if you have time to watch it. Uh, my octopus teacher, because I kept trying to remember the name and then I thought, you know what, just Google man who falls in love with octopus. There's only, trust me, there will not be other movies of this. This is the only one and it's gaining traction. And I don't even, I don't know, we'll talk about it more. I always like to um, finish it with a um, mystery. 
And where do I get these things? From the 2021 Unexplained Mysteries of the History Channel calendar that my parents bought me. I'm sure at the Osage Beach Outlet Mall somewhere. This one, I never heard of it. It's called the Island of the Dolls. La Isla de las Monecas. Does that sound right? How about that? Anybody speak Spanish? I don't. La Isla de las Monecas. Located in the channels. Oh shit, I can't say this. Z X O C H I M I L C O, whatever. South of the center of Mexico City, close to the Estido Azteca football stadium in a Chimnapa. What? Anyway, it's an island, okay? South of Mexico, center of Mexico City. Um, there's various styles of dolls and colors are found out through the island, originally placed by former owner of the island. Julian or Julian Santa Barrera. He believed that the dolls helped chase away the spirit of a girl who drowned years ago. He died in 2001 of a heart attack. Sources say he was close to the same spot where the girl drowned. This is creepy and you can go here. I don't know if I would. <laughs> maybe, maybe, oh no. The Island of the Dolls, originally owned by Julian Santa Barrera, it's full of dolls hanging from trees and buildings covered with cobwebs and insects. The place was named during the 1950s when the owner began to hang them as a production against evil spirits. Santa San, Santana was a neighbor of the Barrio de la Asunis, I don't know, where he used to go in to drink pulque after having sold his vegetables until, due, due to superstitions, he began to preach the Bible being expelled from the sector. So he got a little too Christian-y for the town, and they went, yet, no, no. According to the leg oh, legend, a young woman drowned and tangled amongst the lilies of the canal. Her body was found on the banks of the San Tampa Chim um, Pass. Wow. <laughs> Listen, paddles. <laughs> so bad. It's horrible. I speak a little French. That do doesn't, that do doesn't, that do Well, I can't because I don't even know what it means in English. <laughs> Don Julian began to experience this as the guy. I explicable situations. So terrified, he placed dolls that he found in the garbage or the canals of the place with the idea that they would scare the soul of the young woman who would cry out, I want my doll. Oh. He also found a doll floating nearby and assumed it belonged to the deceased girl, hung it from a tree as a sign of respect. After this, he, would begin, he began to hear whispers, footsteps. Well, I would turn to the Bible at this point, too. This is where I'm with this guy. Um, in the darkness, even though his hut, hidden deep inside the woods, was miles away from civilization, just driven by fear, he spent the next 50 years hanging more and more dolls. Some are missing body parts all over the island in an attempt to appease what he believed was the drowned girl's spirit. In 1987, an eco-tourist rescue was made and the island was found covered with water lilies. Since, after, since then and after the death of Don Julian, it became a, great, a place of great tourist affluence. The place gained fame in 1943 when Mexican filmmaker so-and-so filmed Maria Candelia there with so-and-so and so-and-so. And so. Um, you can go there. They've also done stuff on the, on the Travel Channel and ABC News. His, his death in 2001, it was found by where they said the girl died and she drowned. Um, locals described it as charmed, not haunted, even though travelers claimed the dolls whispered to them. Oh, no. Professional photographer, so-and-so visited Cindy, somebody visited the island and described it as the pleep creepiest place she has ever visited. It was in 2015. The excursion begins through maze-like canals surrounded by lush greenery and singing birds, but soon her boat was slowed down by a swarm of lily pads and the canal felt ominously silent. She told, um, she was being interviewed. At the end of the journey, the Trajanera turned along a benway and I was, I made, I don't know what that word is. I, you don't say J's, so. Cha-inera. They cha-inera? 
turned along a bend in the waterway and I was struck by the surreal vision of hundreds, maybe thousands of dolls hanging from the trees of the tiny island. The dolls are still on the island, which is accessible by boat. It was also featured on Ghost Adventures, Amazon Prime show, Lore, Lore, whatever that is. Um, if you want to get there, that's a real, it's an hour. You go through these canals. It also contains a museum, the island with some articles from local newspapers. And there it's a store, three rooms, uh, which seem to have been used as a bedroom. In this room is the first doll he ever collected, as well as Augustinian, his favorite doll. Okay. I don't know. Would you go? I probably would, but I would probably take quite a few drinks in my backpack. Because as soon as I heard one of them whisper them, I would probably shit my pants. Okay, termites. It was a big day here. Hope you guys had fun. Um, don't get me any birthday presents. <laughs> I knew you wouldn't. Um, it's kind of a weird birthday when you can't really go do what you want. And I was supposed to be, every, every week I look at the calendar of where I was supposed to be and I go, oh shit, I was supposed to be there. I don't know where I was supposed to be on my birthday. I haven't looked up next week yet. Still stuck on where I was supposed to be this week. Anyway, um, okay. That's really all I got for you guys. Um, make sure there wasn't anything else I want to tell you about. Next week, we're also going to be talking about an Arkansas diamond mine. Mine, not mine. Mine, where you can find diamonds and take them home. I'm thinking I might take my mom there for her birthday. She likes to hunt arrowheads. That's her thing. She's a little obsessive. And I think she should marry Jeff Foxworthy because there's a man with a lot of money. And you know what he does? He hunts for arrowheads. That's his hobby. Nothing wrong with that. Just, you know, <sighs> exciting when you find one, but a lot of downtime on that hobby. A lot of downtime. All right, termites. That's all I got for you. I'm going to say night night, termite. Thanks for watching. Subscribe. Get your fishing poles out. It's fall. Let's go fishing. But first, it's time to go to bed. Are you ready? Are you tucked in? You're a good timer. You're a worthy termite. Night, night termites. Mm -hmm.